and welcome to all of you joining us for this crucial discussion on how everything we do can support the climate goals of the Paris Agreement. For many of us during these difficult times, nature has been a consoling and constant companion. But how good a friend have we been to the planet? Well, the scientists tell us we're at a tipping point, that more than ever, the world needs bold and ambitious climate leadership now. Over the next 40 minutes, we'll be exploring what protecting the planet with the Paris Agreement actually means in practice. We'll be speaking to people from all corners of the globe, to policymakers, project developers, financial regulators, and to some of the 400 public development banks who are taking part in this summit. And of course, we'll be giving you the opportunity to put your questions on what is arguably the biggest challenge of our time. And here we are, as if you didn't need any reminding, welcome to all of you joining us for this important discussion, what could be more important, about what ambitious climate leadership really looks like. How can we deliver the goals of the Paris Agreement? And not that, just that, but how can we construct the meaningful partnerships that actually deliver action? Where will public development banks feature in this massive challenge? This is what we're going to be reflecting on over the next 40 minutes or so. I'm Shireen Wheeler from the European Investment Bank. I'm honoured to be running this discussion and to welcome you, all of you joining us as well at Finance in Common for this issue called Global Leadership for Paris Alignment. Don't forget to send us your questions on the chat. We'll get to them later on in uh, the discussion. But first of all, let me introduce our live guests who we've managed to uh, get from their various locations around the world to join us. Uh, and we'll be hearing from many, many people, as you've heard over the next little while. So we have Ambroise Fayol, who is the Vice President of the European Investment Bank in charge of climate policy and development. We have the CEO of KenGen, which is the Kenya Electricity Generating Company. Uh, this is Rebecca Miano. Thanks for joining us, Rebecca. You're coming to us live from Nairobi. Uh, from Seoul in South Korea, we have Javier Manzanares, who is the Deputy Executive Director of the Green Climate Fund. And uh, from Morocco, we have Mohamed Nasiri of the Société d'Aménagement Zenata. Mohamed, nice to see you there. Okay, so we're going to come to uh, Mohamed and Javier a little, in a little while. Um, but first, I want to um, ask uh, Vice President uh, Fayol and Mrs. Uh, Miano to engage with me a little bit uh, on some of the big issues around what we're trying to do. Um, uh, Vice President, first of all, the European Investment Bank, uh, which of course, for those of you who don't know, is the bank of the European Union, owned by its 27 member states, has very much been in the vanguard of climate ambition uh, among the NDDs, the multilateral development banks, in and outside of Europe. But how do you turn the ambition into real action? Good morning, Shirin. Uh, good morning to, uh, to all of you. Um, and uh, very pleased to, uh, to be here. Thanks a lot for uh, Remy Ryu and, uh, and his team to have organized this, uh, this very important summit uh, um, for, for public development banks. 
Um, I would uh, I would say the following. Uh, last year, we decided to embark on a very ambitious journey. And the journey started with a decision to stop financing fossil fuel projects and to embark on a climate bank ambition that would have quantitative and qualitative targets. And I'm very pleased that yesterday, the board of the European Investment Bank has decided unanimously to move forward with what we call a climate bank roadmap, which is a way to operationalize in concrete terms what we are going to do in the next year. And that has basically three main components. One, we have decided to move our climate and environment target of 25% of our um, of our what we do every year for lending to 50% by 2025. So this is a big in increase in a short period of time. The second thing we have decided is for the decade that is so important, 2021 to 2030, we have decided that we would help mobilize one trillion of investment for climate and environment projects. And finally, we have decided that we would uh, have all our financing activities aligned with Paris objectives by end of 2020. That is so if what you do with the one hand is very good for climate, but what you do in terms of projects for non-climate related projects is arming reaching the objectives of uh, the Paris Agreement, this is not consistent. And where I am extremely pleased is that our board yesterday has decided to embark on this. And this is an ambitious roadmap, this is a concrete roadmap that will help us really move towards being the EU climate bank. So I'm very thankful for our board I am very thankful for the teams that have worked so hard. Actually, this is a big motivation for, for the, the teams in, in, in EA work on this kind of projects. I am very, very pleased that we are so closely part of the EU Green Deal that is so important. Thank you so much, Vice President. Uh, and of course, um, I mean, I'm not sure that we can say that the board made this unanimous decision, especially for the Financing Common uh, Summit, uh, but we are delighted uh, to hear that. And of course, this is the kind of leadership that we're looking for, not just for our own institution, but for the community as a whole. Um, this is uh, on the ground, though, it's wh is where the real impact is going to matter. Uh, and I'd like to bring in uh, Rebecca Miano for an example of how that is already <laughs> happening in practice. Uh, Ken Jen, uh, of which you're the CEO, is, is a partner of the EAB, also of the AFD and other multilateral development banks. And the Kenya story is extraordinary. Um, I think last year's Ambition to Action report concluded that Kenya could be a forerunner for Paris-compatible electricity development in the region and globally. Rebecca, what is the role of Kenjen in this massive decarbonisation uh, project of the electricity grid in Kenya? Can you give us a little idea as well of what you've got also up your sleeve for the future? Thank you, Shireen. All the distinguished gentlemen in the panel. And thank you very much for inviting me to this panel to participate in this noble agenda of resilience, climate resilience and the Paris Agreement. I'll start by giving you a country level of, of what we are doing. At country level, we have a, an installed capacity of about 2,800 megawatts and the mix is geothermal 29%, Hydro also contributes 28%. We have some wind at 12% and solar 2% and the thermos at 28%. And this clearly shows that over 80% of 
of the installed capacity of electricity in Kenya is actually renewable. And Kenjen being the leading utility electricity generating company also generates from the various modes and we contribute over 86% of renewable energy in this country. And our vision is to be the leader in provision of reliable and safe electricity in the East African region. And to this end, we have embedded sustainability programs at the core of our transformation strategy. And in accordance with our strategy, our project pipeline going forward comprises only of renewable energy. And this has contributed immensely in the mitigation of climate change and its impacts. And I will tell you that Kenya ranks at number seven in the world among the countries that have advanced geothermal capacity development, and this is courtesy of Kenjin. Thank you, Rebecca. I mean, that's Maybe really I can an extraordinary figure. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I just want the audience to reflect on that. You're saying that currently uh, the energy that Kenya is producing, more than 80% of it is from green renewable sources, right? Right. So what have you got in the and pipeline? Going, first, I'll tell you the motivation of investing in this renewable energy. And the very first one is to climate proof energy infrastructure from climate change and its impact. We have seen that in previous years in Kenya, the over dependence on hydro made the country suffer from power rationing whenever there was a drought. And so the motivation is to ensure that we have sustainability and continuity and that infrastructure projects, especially in the energy sector, are not detrimental to the, to the environment. And the second one is commitment to the Paris Agreement goals. And Kenya pledged to reduce the greenhouse gases emissions by 30% by the year 2030. And the pledge focuses on energy as one of the key contributing sectors. And this will be done through the deployment of the green energy. The other motivation is that we are a signatory and a participant of the UN Global Compact principles. And of course, renewable energy in the long run is cheaper and also uh, healthy, it reduces the respiratory problems that are caused by non green energy. Can I just stop you there, uh, Mrs. Miano, just for a second? I just want to bring uh, VP Fayol in uh, very quickly um, because I just uh, listening to Mrs. Miano there. Um, how do you think that uh, public banks like the EIB um, can? Uh, really do more in terms of both supporting projects like that, but actually to be truly transformational in, in the decade ahead? Um, I, I would say two things. One, I think we need to um, ask public institutions to lead by example. Um, we, are, we have public shareholders. Um, we must have and finance projects and and help in the way that uh, that that are not necessarily the way that uh, that is we, we cannot finance projects for example that are financed if, if they can be financed by the private sector it, it makes yeah. it makes no sense so uh, the, the way i would say is first leading by example in terms of policies in terms of uh, the kind of uh, of, of a roadmap that we can we can we can put forward, and I think this is what we have done uh, at uh, the European Investment Bank. And the other thing is um, to help create and develop markets. And let me give you an example. Uh, we are financing with a big European asset manager a project that uh, is going to help financial institutions in emerging and developing countries. Uh, 
um, develop the green bond market there. Because it is true that the, the, the challenge of uh, climate change is global, but the uh, green bonds are very often in uh, in certain parts of the world, in Europe, in the, in, in the US, in, in, in industrialized countries. And we think that this is something that we need to help develop financial institutions in emerging countries to have this kind of green bond uh, being issued. And for that, we need also to help them create the infrastructure, the monitoring, uh, comply with the principles that, uh, that will make sure that what we do is right. And that uh, actually this is not, for example, something that is, uh, that is often said, that is uh, financing greenwashing. So for that, we need to uh, we need the, the public institutions because they are they, they have the the means they have the resources and they have they have the willingness to help thank you we're going to come back to some of those points in a moment uh, also uh, with the green climate fund and uh, uh, Rebecca, I want to bring you in again later but first let's just hear from a couple of our colleagues and partners from another part of the world uh, Costa Rica first of all Andrea Meza Morillo and uh, New Zealand, where we'll hear what uh, the Reserve Bank of New Zealand is doing in terms of greening their financial system. I want to thank the European Investment Bank and the organizers of the Financing Commons Summit for creating this space to discuss the common need to build a new prosperity that take care of people and the planet in a resilient manner. Costa Rica's climate efforts in the past decades place our country in a favorable position to move towards a net zero world. We have stopped and reversed deforestation, which is the largest source of CO2 emissions for tropical countries. We have a largely renewable electricity grid with over 99% coming from water, air, geothermal, and sun. And our country has invested for decades in high quality public education and health. These conditions enable our transition towards the economy of the future, which is decentralized, decarbonized, and digitalized. We have already taken steps to move in that direction. In 2015, we launched a forward-looking NDC, which was rated as one of the most ambitious in the world. And we plan to present an updated and more ambitious version this year. In 2019, we launched our long-term strategy to transform our economy towards a low-carbon future in line with the Paris Agreement. Our national decarbonization plan works on 10 key areas from public transport to nature-based solutions with a goal to reach net zero emissions by 2050. This target is consistent with a 1.5 world. This plan works in conjunction with other climate policies on emission reductions and adaptation to climate impacts, and also with other development policies. Given our country's high vulnerability to such impacts, our national adaptation policy was published in 2019 and our adaptation plan is currently being elaborated. These policies will provide the country with tools to improve resilience in key areas, including infrastructure, productive and efficient systems, tourism, water resources, management, biodiversity and health. Costa Rica has been a pioneer in using its own resources to have a clean electricity grid and to stop deforestation. We are now mobilizing also our own resources to begin the decarbonization process, but we also need financial and technical collaboration from allies and friends to accelerate this transformation. Many of our key policies have been developed with international partners, including public development banks, as you have realized that supporting our efforts is a way to accelerate the transformation of the world. As public development banks look into the decades ahead, particularly the crucial decade of 2020, we must renew the bond. Developing countries need support to strengthen our move into the economy of the future. Our national determined contribution and our national decarbonization plan, we have a clear investment plan with a portfolio of specific projects that can be supported by these public development banks. This is a clear opportunity for collaboration. Costa Rica can be a decarbonization laboratory for the world to reinforce what has been learned today and to progress in areas where others see innovative examples. We are looking forward to building together a better world for everyone.
Tēnā koutou katoa and hello from Aotearoa, New Zealand. Thank you to the European Investment Bank for organising this important discussion. It's timely to be at this first global summit of all public development banks. With all of the investment the world is making on COVID recovery, we can't miss this opportunity to work on climate change together. Like many central banks, we see climate change as a key risk to financial stability through impacts like drought, rising seas, impacts on asset valuations such as farms and houses. Our interest is foremost the impact on our financial institutions. We're also aware of what we can do ourselves. Our climate strategy incorporates climate into our core functions, manages our direct impact and provides leadership across the financial system. We're proud of our progress. We've recently trained our supervisors in climate risk and we're stepping up our supervisory efforts. We take every opportunity to raise awareness through speeches, our financial stability reports, direct stakeholder engagement, and we lead New Zealand's Council of Financial Regulators Climate Workstream. A big focus for New Zealand this year is developing a proposal for the mandatory disclosure of climate related financial risks. This was led by our Ministry for the Environment and our Ministry for Business, Innovation and Employment. We see disclosure as an important tool to help firms manage their own risks. Disclosures would be made in line with the TCFD on, and on a comply or explain basis. The proposal would cover all publicly listed companies, large insurers, banks and investment managers. This comprises around 90% of all assets under management in New Zealand. So this broad approach would be a world first. If approved by Parliament next year, firms would start disclosing from 2022. We see climate change as a global effort. We're playing our part, learning and engaging globally through the Network for Greening the Financial System, the Sustainable Insurance Forum and events like this. Connecting is critical. When it comes to taking care of the environment, many cultures are guided by wisdom. The Māori world, Te Ao Māori, centres on connecting with each other, nature and long-term guardianship, which is a great place to start. Thank you for listening. Enjoy the rest of the summit. Noho oro mai. Take care. Stay well. Well, that was uh, Simon Roberts there, the Deputy Governor of the Reserve Bank of New Zealand, and before her, Andrea Meza from uh, Costa Rica, the Minister of Energy. I'm delighted now, though, to join in, bring into the conversation uh, Javier Manzanares, uh, Deputy uh, Executive Director of the Green Climate Fund based in Seoul. Welcome, Javier, and uh, Mohamed Nasiri as well from Zenata in Morocco. Um, can I turn to you first of all, uh, Javier, from the Green Climate Fund's perspective, we know that you are the largest uh, fund in the world, in fact, helping developing countries reduce emissions and respond to climate change. So you have a crucial role, don't you, in, in fact, delivering the Paris Agreement. Tell us a little more about that and your ambitions uh, for the coming critical decade. Yeah, thank you, uh, Shirin. Uh, greetings from uh, Korea. Um, uh, my appreciation uh, for uh, today's uh, event, uh, Finance in Common. I uh, also our gratitude to uh, EIB as well as uh, IDFC, uh, AFD, uh, Remy Rios in, uh, in particular. Uh, well, yes, uh, GCF's mandate is uh, to foster a paradigm shift towards uh, low emission and climate resilient development pathways in developing countries. I would like to, uh, to share with you uh, that uh, this week is our board uh, meeting 27 and uh, yesterday our board approved uh, another 12 projects uh, for one billion dollars that brings uh, our portfolio uh, to approximately seven billion dollars uh, for more than 140 projects covering more than 100 countries uh, also, the, the, the GCF has a readiness support program to build capacity uh, in uh, help countries developing long-term plans to fight climate change. And this uh, has already accounted for more than $260 million in grants. 
Uh, the DCF, uh, you were you were mentioning about the Paris Agreement, and uh, yes, indeed, our, our role is to serve the Paris Agreement. Our role is to support the Paris Agreement uh, in the goal of keeping the average global temperature at a price well below uh, 2 degrees Celsius. So for that, what it means in terms of estimates is uh, uh, mitigation, uh, 1.1 trillion uh, gigatons in CO2 equivalent reduction or avoidance. It means that half of our portfolio is dedicated to adaptation. In terms of resilience, it means that approximately 400 million people uh, have been, will be benefited by uh, our support. Now, your, your question in terms of ambitions. I would like to uh, frame that uh, in, uh, in, in four major ambitions for the DCF during the, the coming decade. Uh, the first the major ambition is to assist non-Annex One countries in their aspirations and abilities to place climate action at the center of COVID-19 recoveries. Our second major ambition is to address the shortfall developing countries face by helping to catalyze new private and public financial flows. We have a shared ambition with uh, IDFC uh, for a collaboration between the GCF and IBSC to unlock the necessary part of the 2.3 trillion potential of public development banks to finance low carbon, climate resilient development pathways while promoting sound governance. A third uh, major ambition sharing is uh, that the GCF climate finance supports developing countries and local communities consideration. Our respect for indigenous people communities consideration our respect for We're back with you, but um, 
I think our technical team will tell us once we are back live with you. Okay, hello everybody. Uh, we're back with you. Uh, sorry about that. We had a little technical issue, one of the many challenges, apart from climate change and COVID, that we're all facing today. Mm. But uh, back to uh, Javier, um, and uh, you were just telling us about uh, ambition um, and and the and the role of the uh, Green Climate Fund. Can I actually mm. just ask you now, a bit more specifically? In what way can the Green Climate Fund, in your view, do more to support public development banks? We've actually also got a question from uh, the audience. Uh, and thank you uh, for those of you who are sending your questions. I am going to try and get back to them in a minute. But a very specific one for you, which is on um, uh, national development banks. How can, uh, how can they get more access to uh, Green Climate Fund money, basically? Yeah, thank you, uh, Shirin. Uh, let me start by uh, by sharing with you an announcement uh, that uh, the DCF has uh, very recently approved a seven hundred thousand dollar grant uh, to support thirteen direct access entities, uh, which are public development banks and members of IDFC. Uh, this initiative strengthens the capacities of national and regional development banks to scale up their climate activities, including leveraging resources for climate action and mainstreaming climate finance into their daily operations. Uh, and apart from that, and more generally speaking, uh, the GCF uh, is well positioned to contribute to unlocking the full potential of PDBs. Uh, that is to say, promoting sound governance and management co-financing and risk sharing, deepening local capital markets. I would also add to that strengthening capacity and deal flow management and the integration into the global climate finance landscape. Uh, GCFs, uh, because of the greater risk appetite than other institutions, uh, we can definitely partner with the, with the public development bank so that we structure together deals where the GCF is prone to take the, the risk of the first loss, to take the higher part of the risk of a project and uh, co-finance along with uh, this very large, impressive network of public development banks. Over to you, Siren. Thank you very much, uh, Javier. Uh, of course, we're going to come back to you in a moment, but uh, let me turn to Mohamed uh, Nasiri now. Thanks, Mohamed, um, for waiting patiently there. Now, Zenata, uh, which is what we're going to talk about again, a really concrete example of how this is happening on the ground, is the first African city to win the Eco City label. Um, the vision of that city was all about climate resilience and low carbon emissions as well. Um, Tell us a little bit about the vision uh, behind this city and actually what it's taken uh, to get to where you are. Thank you, Shirin. Thank you, everybody. Uh, a few words about the city. It's a large project. It's over 5,000 acres or 1,800 hectares. Uh, it, it ambitions to welcome 300,000 inhabitants and create 100,000 jobs just to give you an idea of the scale of this project. Um, to answer your question quickly, uh, I think uh, everything starts from a local perspective and ours was very strong and in, in the social and environmental aspect really shaped the ambition of the project from day one uh, since we we have actually a joint project with uh, more than 45,000 people living in slums, 200 industries working illegally and so many constraints actually that comes from the territory. So from day one we were in an inclusive and collaboration in the perspective uh, that really um, put us in a path of sustainability uh, without really uh, uh, thinking of it uh, naturally. So over the, over, over the time, over time, we think that um, we realized that the best thing that happened to us was really 
understanding sustainability and answering local issues. Uh, so Mohammed, can I just stop you there for a moment? I think I think we've got some very bad sound uh, problems on your line at the moment. Um, the technical people will tell me if I'm right. Um, so I just want to stop you there because I don't want you to uh, to waste your your energy. But as far as I understand, if I can recap a little bit on a little of what you've been saying there. Um, just for the benefit of uh, ben benefit of those who didn't catch it, you've actually um, worked with uh, some forty five thousand people from the slum areas, right? That that's what you told us, and I think that that's really interesting. So I guess the issue of community engagement has been as important as the climate um, considerations that you've built into this project. Absolutely, community engagement is key and uh, uh, enthusiasm uh, and collaboration as well. Governance, I would say, is another important point. Okay, okay. sorry, I'm going to stop you there because I get, I get the point. But again, we're going to have to uh, we're going to have to try and sort your sound out there. Um, I want to just uh, come very quickly now. We've got a few questions coming from the floor, um, and uh, I want to just throw one of them, if I may, um, to to the vice president. I'm going to try and get through um, get through them. Um, the, there is a there is a, vice president. I'm going to start with a, a slightly tricky one, if you don't mind. Um, uh, there's mixed reaction um, to the Climate Bank Roadmap. Um, you know, we're getting kind of uh, on the chat here, definitely uh, some sort of sense that many people feel this is a highly ambitious, really uh, uh, encouraging uh, model, particularly for others in the MDB community. Others um, particularly are from organizations like Greenpeace, it might not surprise you, um, are saying that actually this isn't as good as it might look and that they, they are concerned that the EIB is actually continuing to finance polluting industries um, uh, and that this is in some way not, not uh, conducive with the commitment to be Paris aligned. Um, what would you say to that, uh, Vice President? I would say two things. Uh, I would say first, yes, it is a big step forward and it is an ambitious roadmap. Um, and if, uh, if, if you want uh, just uh, one example, we have decided to stop financing airports expansions. I mean, for, for, for us till now, this is not at all what uh, what, what, what was in our policy. And this is a decision that has been taken in the Climate Bank Roadmap. Mm -hmm. uh, we will concentrate our efforts to finance, for example, for the industry, uh, low carbon industry research. We don't finance industry per se, but we finance research, for example, uh, and research and development. Uh, but the second thing I would say is, what is clear is that um, this, this document is a living document. Uh, for example, next year, we will come back to our board with the issue of how do we deal with counterparts? Do we assess the decarbonization plans of, of our counterparts? Mm -hmm. We do that actually already for some of the high emitting companies. When we finance, for example, a big, a big plan for charging station for electric vehicles, but this is a high emitting company, we need to look at the way this company is uh, doing its decarbonization uh, ambitions. But we will come more generally next year. So this is not something that is the end of the year. And we will have to adapt depending on, for example, how the EU taxonomy is evolving. Yes. The, the taxonomy uh, has, has made progress on many fronts, but not on all. And this is something we will need to adjust also the Paris alignment objectives of the bank depending on what is the final outcome of the EU taxonomy. Okay, an important message there. Uh, and I think one to our civil society um, partners, and I say partners, um, you know, because this is a real engagement and this roadmap is very much the fruit of that engagement, uh, that let's keep the conversation going. Uh, there are many uh, more steps uh, and many more discussions to be had. But in, in the vice president's view, this is a significant way forward. I want to turn now to some of our partners actually who weren't able to make this live chat. Um, we have a, a series of major funders for international development here now on what 
ambitious plans and commitments they're making for the critical decade ahead, starting with the German presidency of the EU and then the European Commission. Excellencies, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, public development banks in general and multilateral development banks in particular have important roles to play in global climate action. They need to assume a leading role in supporting climate neutral and resilient economies and they have been strong allies for that endeavor over the past few years. Three years ago at the One Planet Summit which has also been held in Paris, multilateral development banks and the International <laughs> Development Finance Club committed to align their activities with the goals of the Paris Agreement. Translating this commitment into politics and action is key and of the relevance far beyond the bank's direct lending. Germany is providing strong support to these efforts. We urge all development banks to deliver on their Paris alignment commitments, presenting more ambitious targets and action over the time. Aligning international financial flows with the objectives of the Paris Agreement is more important than ever in the current context as we are designing economic stimulus and investment programs for the post-COVID recovery. The post-COVID recovery needs to be green if it's to be sustainable. In its role as a current EU Council Presidency, Germany is also committed to help translating the European Green Deal into action within the framework of the Union's external action, for instance, when it comes to supporting the green energy transition in Africa. We count on strong collaboration with multilateral development banks in this field too. We are looking forward to continuing our cooperation with you in the run up to COP26 and beyond. The Kenyan environmentalist Wangari Matai called for a shift in our thinking so that humanity stops threatening its life support system. I am convinced that the Paris Agreement embodies exactly such a shift. The European Union is not only shifting its thinking, it is also acting on it and it is building its climate action on three solid pillars. First of all, we are trying to lead by example. We adopted groundbreaking policies which show that protecting nature and achieving sustainable growth is possible and affordable. And we are ready to share our experience with partners across the globe so that we can all benefit from the green transitions. Secondly, we are backing up our policies with substantial funding. We're putting our money where our mouth is and together with the European Investment Bank and with our member states, we are the world's biggest contributor of climate finance for developing countries. Between 2014 and 2019, the share of EU development budget dedicated to climate objectives in partner countries has increased from 10% to 25%. And in the next seven-year budget, that percentage will be even higher. We will also generate large-scale climate-friendly investment through some of the innovative features of our new instrument. Thirdly, we are fostering partnerships in all regions of the world with partners committed to address climate change. We are working closely with many banks here today and with the private sector. Prime example is a 5 billion euro external investment plan, which we have completed today, ahead of deadline with the signature of a final series of guarantee agreements. Looking ahead, we will only succeed to halt climate change if we really make it a global effort. The COVID-19 crisis is a manifestation of the changing world we live in. But it's also an example of why it is so crucial for all of us and for our future generations to adopt a sustainable growth model 
that is green, digital, socially just and resilient, in line with the Paris Agreement and with the SDGs. In doing so, I strongly believe we will play a major role in protecting the life support system to which Wangari Matai was referring and on which we all depend. Thank you. Thank you to our partners there at Team Europe for sharing their ambitions. Let's hear now from some of the world's biggest public development banks. Distinguished delegates, I am delighted and honoured to speak to you in this important event on behalf of the multilateral development banks. My remarks focus on the progress that we have made collectively on climate action since COP21. MDB Climate Finance has been steadily increasing since 2015 and in 2019 MDB's reported commitments of 41.5 billion US dollars in low and middle income economies. Over the past year, the majority of Twenty-one, MDB Climate Finance has been steadily increasing since 2015 and in 2019 MDB's reported commitments of 41.5 billion US dollars in low and middle income economies. Over the past year, the majority of MDBs have announced their new climate finance targets, committing to significant increases. The Islamic Development Bank, for example, announced its first ever climate finance target of 35% of its total annual financing by 2025. It is worth noting that most MDBs have either met or exceeded their 2020 climate finance target. Going beyond climate finance, in 2018, the MDBs announced a joint Paris alignment framework to support client efforts in achieving the goals of the Paris Agreement and a plan to develop a dedicated approach. This month, the MDBs have held a technical briefing to review progress, and as promised, we have developed a robust multi-criteria framework to assess a project's alignment with the Paris Agreement and the client's mitigation goals, as well as criteria for alignment with climate resilient pathways. Over the past months, the framework has been customized to take into account the diverse nature of our development operations and development contexts where we operate. This work highlighted the importance of countries and other clients' long-term climate strategies, making us examine how we have been supporting climate strategy and policy development in our countries of operation. We have already started looking into ways of enhancing our country engagement strategies in support of the Paris Agreement goals. Despite the progress that has been recorded, we still have a long, great many challenges ahead. Nevertheless, we are on the right trajectory and continuing to work on this together offers us great opportunities to further embed climate considerations into global development efforts and make the years ahead the best in our history for climate action. Thank you. 
My name is Patrick Lamini. I work for the Development Bank of Southern Africa. We are members of the International Development Finance Club. We put together as a group about 187 billion US dollars worth of climate financing, which is by far the biggest in the world. And that to me says, as members of the International Development Finance Club, we have a very massive role to drive towards the one trillion climate financing as requested by the United Nations Secretary General. This is something that as IDFCs and many other development finance institutions, we have to drive with all the energy that we have and also be able to share amongst ourselves the expertise on how we best can be able to structure climate financing deals and projects so that countries can begin to realize the benefits and the impact that we can all be able to assist our government and our countries in achieving the Paris Accord as well as the Sustainable Development Goals. I strongly believe that as IDFC members, we have a very massive role to play. We want to make sure that we are able to operationalize the framework for our members to work with in terms of climate financing. We also want to leverage on our relationship that we have established and built with the Green Climate Fund to make sure that our members are able to get accreditation to the Green Climate Fund and also be able to have the funding that comes from the Green Climate Fund into our projects in our respective countries and regions to ensure that we really are able to drive the full implementation of both the Sustainable Development Goals as well as the Paris Accord. Consider the top issue facing development finance institutions. How can we grow capital flows to help reach the Sustainable Development Goals by 2030 and implement the Paris Climate Agreement? We need to make sure that the financing and advice that we provide to private enterprises in developing countries will make the biggest possible difference. I'd like to tell you about the joint ambitions that we are now setting out on climate and energy related finance. We set out these ambitions now ahead of the Financing Commons Summit and next year's COP26. And as countries are striving to make a sustainable recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic, they can be summarized as six key commitments. We will align all financing with the Paris Agreement and transition our portfolios to net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. We will exclude coal and fuel oil financing and limit other fossil fuels until they're generally excluded by 2030. We will build on our track record of investing and mobilizing billions for renewable energy and other climate finance by setting ambitious targets and holding ourselves to them. We will support our clients to develop Paris-aligned projects that promote green growth and access to clean energy and advance climate adaptation and resilience, nature-based solutions, and a just transition to the low carbon economy. We will make transparent climate-related disclosures based on high international standards following the recommendations of the TCFD. And we will embed climate action and climate risk management at every level of our institutions. DFIs are diverse institutions. Just like private investors, they will follow different paths, making best efforts. Some will go further and faster in some areas, while others will need more time for implementation. But we believe that by working together, we can have the greatest impact. The European DFIs announce our ambitions now to set an example for other investors. I hope you will join us. Well, thanks uh, to those uh, partners of ours uh, for those crucial points. And I think bringing up some themes that I, I can see from your questions now, uh, you want to hear our panelists respond to. Uh, the key issue there is how can, as a community, the public development banks work together, um, the financial community? It's a question uh, from Oil Change International, which says um, the EIB has shown leadership in excluding fossil fuels from their financing. Um, and also uh, EDFI, we just heard there from Soren Anderson, 
are also starting to adopt fossil fuel restrictions. How do we make sure that other banks follow this level of ambition? I'm going to join and uh, also take another question as well, um, just because we can cover that uh, quickly together. There's a question from E3G, um, the uh, third generation um, environmentalism, Sonia uh, Dunlop, who asks whether in this, um, in this climate bank roadmap, are we approaching a consensus on what Paris alignment actually means uh, for financiers and uh, public banks? Um, and then I've got another question, which I'll just put to you in a moment, but maybe I can ask, uh, let, let's ask um, Javier first to come in and then Vice President uh, Fayol as well um, on that issue about what public banks can do together. Mm. Yeah, thank you, Sharon. Uh, uh, from our experience uh, working uh, with uh, a large network uh, like uh, IDFC uh, makes a big difference. Uh, we have at this point uh, 30 uh, PDBs, uh, public development banks, that have been accredited uh, with the GCF. Uh, what it is, is what it means is that we deploy our uh, climate finance support through entities that get accredited with, uh, with us. Uh, this is ex this is extraordinarily important because uh, as a small fund in terms of, of, of staff, we would not be able to uh, to truly operate with the hundreds of uh, of uh, national development banks, uh, uh, individually speaking. Uh, so having an association, having an international uh, body like IDFC, like uh, another one would be Alide. Uh, Alide uh, represents the public, national public development banks in Latin America. That's also a large network. Um, if, I, if I can uh, uh, perhaps respond to your question or the question, it takes a lot of uh, working together, coordination with uh, large entities, associations that can reach out to the members, that can benefit, that can facilitate the communication among all of them. Over to you. Thanks. Maybe over to Vice President Fayol. How do we make these partnerships actually more than talking shops? Well, this is uh, this is indeed uh, the, the important question. I I, I, I would say first, um, this is very important that we had this event today. I mean, there are four hundred uh, public development banks that are meeting on on this very issue. So. Uh, this is a sign that uh, this, this, this issue of uh, how to meet with Paris Agreement is something that is gaining interest everywhere. The second thing I would say is we need to uh, learn not by working in silos, but to learn by uh, working together, learning uh, from what we do, what others do, learning, learning by what we uh, do with, uh, with our clients, uh, learning with do with our partners that is something that is indeed quite uh, quite quite important the last thing i would say is uh, the sooner we engage this the better because climate change is really moving very quickly i want to ask you one question vice president there's a very specific one about the impact of the eu taxonomy on sustainable finance on the eib paris alignment um what lessons uh, then also can be learned for other MDBs in this relation? There is a close relationship, right, with the EU taxonomy. Yeah, and the EU taxonomy is indeed uh, quite uh, advanced uh, in, in, in dealing with, uh, with, with issues related to Paris Agreement. What I would just say very quickly is to make it short, the EU taxonomy is the, uh, a strong basis that we have used for our Paris alignment strategy because it is based on a very important principle, which is the do not harm principle. And the do not significant harm principle is the basis for what we have done in our strategy for the Paris alignment part. Okay, leading on from that, I think uh, the idea of not doing significant harm, this obviously has to take in uh, the issue of social impact. Uh, the Paris Agreement does say 
that there is a need to respect, promote and consider human rights, sustainable development and in environmental integrity. I want to bring in Mohammed and uh, Rebecca here a little bit and then back to uh, Vice President Fayol because it's specifically asking the EIB, uh, what will you do uh, to ensure that um, and what are you doing to ensure that human rights are incorporated into climate action? Um, Rebecca, you've had experience in terms of dealing with the issue of resettlement. So have you, uh, Mohammed. Um, there are still some who say that, the, that some of the projects aren't yet completely resolved. But what is the view of Kengen on this important issue, uh, particularly into relation of, uh, in relation to some of the projects like Valkaria? Thank you, Shirin. Again, I want to start by saying that Kenjan is fully committed to uphold environmental and social standards, and we want to meet and exceed the minimum national legal and regulatory requirements, and also the best practices from development partners. And also being a participant of the UN Global Compact principles, that cover human rights, labor, environment, anti-corruption, we report on our performance. And we are cognizant of the fact that people are a partner and communities are a partner in our key developments. And they are so strategic because they give us the social license to implement our projects. And towards this end, we have then implemented a robust community engagement strategy that was approved by the board in 2018. And together with our development partners, we have an approach that is consistent and continuously involving the communities so that they become self-sustaining in their livelihoods. And the example of Volcaria is very important I won't, Our Rebecca, 280 sorry megawatts to project. Sorry to interrupt you, Rebecca. I won't ask you to go into the great detail on that project, um, but I know that it is available uh, for, for people to look at uh, if they need it. Let me bring the more general question to you, Vice President, uh, about the role of the EIB in working with promoters and ensuring this principle is enshrined in projects. I mean, well, for us uh, at, uh, at the Bank of the European Union, of course, human rights is uh, is absolutely essential, and uh, and 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 we we apply high environment and uh, and social standards. We also can help and support the, the promoters to uh, to make sure these uh, these high standards are applied. Uh, but what I would say is uh, is also that uh, this is an issue that we that that we look at uh, currently. Uh, we will uh, issue uh, by your end uh, a guidance note for uh, for promoters to help them uh, in the how can we engage more uh, with with uh, stakeholders uh, and uh, we will also next year have a, a full um, a public consultation and a full comprehensive review uh, on the issue of uh, the, the social and environmental standards of, uh, of EIB, so that uh, we can have uh, also a, a view from uh, from, the, from the stakeholders on, on on this that we could uh, include in uh, in our uh, in our uh, standards. Thank you very much, Vice President. Um, I think we're going to. I'm terribly sorry, but I've looked at the clock and I see that we are running out of time, and I'm going to have to. Um, say to all of you joining us that we haven't got to uh, your questions yet, that I will promise you the conversation goes on. Uh, we, all of us, I think our partners included, uh, over the next several months, as the Vice President said, we'll be continuing to look more closely, not just at what the EIB is doing, but what we're doing as, um, as a whole and as a partnership. Um, I'm going to ask just very, very quickly in about two lines, uh, Vice President, to conclude for us what happens next? What happens after this summit? How can we take forward what we're talking about today? Well, we need to work together and to continue this uh, great uh, this great event by sharing views, uh, sharing lessons, 
and uh, I look forward to uh, to the next step, which uh, I hope also will include uh, such an event uh, next year. Okay, well, on that note, I'd like to thank all of those who joined us by video, but especially um, you here on the stage, uh, Javier Manzanares, Rebecca Miano, Mohamed Nasiri. Uh, sorry about some of the technical glitches, but I think we've seen extraordinary examples of climate leadership uh, and uh, let's keep it going. Let's keep the ambition high. Certainly the world needs it more than ever. On that note, thank you very much, all of you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.